Thanks so much for coming, Charlie. Welcome back to Zone for Impact. Charlie is awesome. If I had to describe Charlie in one word, it would be awesome or amazing. Charlie's been a service designer, innovation leader for probably longer than I've been like alive. He's experienced across a lot. He doesn't look that old, I know, but he's he's very... I mean, I, I feel it. He's worked on quite a lot uh, of national, international projects across social behavior change and uh, healthcare and aged care and things like that, which is which are super complex and super sensitive. He loves finding the human story through insightful field research. And I feel like when you look through Charlie's you know, insights reports and things like that, that's a Charlie insights report because it really focuses like on photography and storytelling as like the way to, to get the, the point to uh, point across the decision makers. So I've known Charlie for how long now? What? Seven years, maybe. Oh my God. Yeah. Long time. That's crazy. Seven years. We worked together for about five years at Think Place and he's been one of my big mentors and and probably a big driving force for how this community actually got started. So excited to have you, Charlie, and over to you. Cool. Thanks, Abram. Yeah, so quick little bit about where I came to doing all this prototyping stuff from. And like Abram said, I started probably dot-com boom in digital tech and really liked, I was a UX designer, developer, et cetera, but really liked the kind of, usability testing side and the idea that stuff I create could be better. It can always be better if you um, open yourself up to it being tested. And if you are willing to see that your design isn't always perfect. And so I got into usability testing and went to the UK to do that quite heavily in mid 2000s and did some a uh, lot more interviewing and other practice sort of stuff throughout that. Came around to joining ThinkPlace in, I think it was 2014, after working for a couple of consultancies, PwC and some other digital boutique places, and moved over into more service design because I just thought, this is where it's at. This is up the stream. Digital is one channel. And like thinking about, Kyle, about financial, you were saying before, in Australia, we've got a massive problem where that whole industry is not going to be viable in, in terms of um, insurance due to things like climate change. Or, or, and they're literally scrambling to say, how do we create a whole new model of this before we even get down to digital products? How do we create a whole new industry model? Those kind of things. And I think those are the problems that really attracted me to Think Place and joining that and saying, let's start at that real top end of society and complex systems and all the sort of nasty stuff that is really hard to solve and uh, and that's really fun and so then eventually did you eventually do little bits of digital or bits of social behavior change or other things like that but the core of it i think is that desire to know that anything you create can be improved if you're willing to test it and just be open to people finding flaws in it if that <laughs> makes sense that brings us a little bit to the background of why I like doing this. I like doing this because I think you can only, you never run out of um, iterations. You just run out of time and money. And, and I think like when, if you ever get a chance in a project to prototype and test it, and you don't always, but if you do, it's a really valuable opportunity and a, a real blessing for any project. Some, hey, Sashin, how are you going? Welcome today. I'm just giving an intro. We're not too far in. And just on on prototyping is most, I suppose my roots of it would be in, in prototyping digital tools, you know, screen flows and apps and all that kind of stuff. And it's very encased in the digital world. And we don't like to think if, when I was a digital designer early days, I thought didn't like to think too much about why is someone even using my app in the first place? Let's not worry about that. Let's just assume they're using my app, you know, and let's figure that bit out and just let's make that really usable. But after a while, it eats away at you and you think, why, how did someone get here? Why would someone use this? Why would someone use my plastic free products, if Darina, if that's your challenge? Like, why would they use it over something else? What's the situation? What are the societal pressures? What are the kind of behaviors around it? And so today, the session, I really want to focus on 
not necessarily teaching you how to make a prototype because your different expertises and your intros were some products, some sort of more, I'm guessing, process. And Brian, you may get into sort of space design and to prototyping spaces with your architectural background. Like that could be really cool too. So I, I want to more think about giving you that zoom out picture of like how does someone arrive and how does a complex system of people interact with your product and how do you learn from that through a prototype so let's do a bit of a check-in and we've got a nice small number of people so uh, we can really i want you to go to the mirror and throw your name on a post-it just to test everything's working but then also a poster underneath that, pick one or two or three and say, what are you looking to get out of this session today? I'll run the session then and I'll come back to that list at the end and we'll have a chat if we haven't covered it and we'll have a chat about exactly what, what's on your mind at the moment. Let's go over to that mirror now. I think the link is in the chat and I'm wondering if Sashin, if you have that link. Abram, would you mind reposting? Oh, thanks. Cool, okay. Let's just take a couple of minutes to think about that question. What are you looking for from this session? Anything you want? I would say I'm looking forward to looking at prototypes and comprehending them in a different way than I have in the past. Yeah, so just chuck that on a post it there, Sashin, and we'll... So when you say comparing them in a different way, what say it more? It's more of um, my comprehensive prototype is from the physical world of physical good engineered materials. So systems and service prototypes are, service I would say kind of a systems and service prototype is something which I probably have interacted with, but I do not under, understand them conceptually. And so I want to build that con concept in my head and have a well-rounded understanding of it, the best. Great, yeah, we'll definitely cover that. And and please do put that on a post-it as well. But I think, yeah, that's exactly where I wanna take you guys today is thinking about, yes, you've got the thing you're building, be it a product or a digital thing or a process or a, a design for something or other, but I want you to think about how the prototype interacts with the broader complex system of people around it. And so that's, I think, where we're, we'll help you out today. Cool. Okay. Everybody got one of those posts for now. We'll come to those at the end. And if um, it hasn't, if we haven't covered that in the session, we'll have a bit of chat specific on that. Okay. Let's get started then, Abram, on the next parts. So, what's everybody's experience with prototyping so far? And I'm asking this question for two reasons. One, for a general sense of like where you're at and in have, if you've had a chance to do any or, or, or and also what you would like to be doing or missed opportunities or things like that. But the second reason I'm asking is also because I want you to think about a specific example from your recent, either your recent work what, that you're doing now or past as a kind of a thing that you can use throughout this session hypothetically so that you can better engage with the session but yeah what's your experience with prototyping anyone so i'll give two examples because they're almost total opposites the first is uh, when i've had to work scrappy in a, in a small group i'm the only designer i don't have many resources that i'm like three pis ahead of the rest of the development team my prototyping is whiteboarding it's like it's basic sketches and we're wireframing just with post-its and erasable markers. And if, if we're able to understand how things move, then, and that translates to something that a, a developer can understand, we're good to go. Today, I'm in a project that is heavily funded, overloaded with people, enough people that are actually sitting around saying, I need stuff to do. And we have our, our own in-house design system. So every time somebody comes up with a concept, they sit down and they spend an entire PI building it out in a full hi-fi workable space. And then we go test it. And then if there are any changes, it's tons and tons of work to, to redo it and unpack it. And 
we get all of those there's that constant fear that we're putting something that's a finished product in front of people and asking for them to be critical and we don't know if they're 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 rounding the edges or not because they don't want to beat up on our finished product those sort of things so two very different experiences i 100 percent sympathize with that kyle and it's it's one thing even when you have too much resources it's like now I have to organize a whole work plan for all these people. And that's right. just as stressful as not having enough people. But also exactly. that, that fear of, that fear of, is it too high fidelity? Is it not high fidelity enough? And most of my work these days is with government and they are absolutely petrified of someone seeing something that's not absolutely watertight. It's quite hard to break through. So uh, very much sympathize there. <laughs> but that's great. Those are two excellent examples. Thank you, Carl. And they'll be really useful for today. Anyone else? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go. I had some very cursory kind of exposure to proto prototyping with some design sprints I was a part of, but I feel more like di diving up or reaching back further to the more kind of arts side of things and architecture using uh, prototyping, the sense of physical modeling of buildings in a to think something through. And it's really to understand the concept as a gesture and how those things kind of work as an abstract before getting to further detail where one would then like get into drawings and how the spatial arrangements work and etc but it, it's a means of thinking something through and understanding the, the gesture of it it's hard to do in the mind without playing with something physical that's my closest yeah, hundred percent. And I think um, I, I'm just thinking of one project. Abraham, you might remember this one, but the Kenya Think Place team did, where it was something to do with women's health, and there was stigma attached to going to certain clinics. And the prototype they created was actually a different entrance. Like before you get into the whole service or anything like that, it was like let's just create a different entrance that doesn't have the kind of the hospital stigma attached to it that, that was part of their research that we're finding. And so this is why I think, Brian, like when you said you had an architecture background, there's the stacks in, in an overlap to a service design world that I think service designers often miss is, yes, we have this service, but there's a whole stack about space design that needs to um, happen in, in a lot of things. Even digital products have sometimes have space design aspects, especially kiosks and all those kind of things. Yeah, look, and, and prototyping can be literally, I think in that instance, they they prototyped by using like some back door and dressing it up to make it look like a better entrance or something of some building. It was really um, sketchy, but it was like you say, a way to play through some of the aspects of that design and how people would reach the service in, in the first place. Yeah, very exciting. Cool. Darina, Sashin? Yeah, sure. So my experience has been with with engineered physical products and two kinds of prototypes. One is a prototype to validate that the mechanism or the product can look and do and function as intended. And then the second one is more of the perception that people have. One thing I've realized is that in, in that pathway is that very often the mistakes that we made were we looked at the prototype in an environment which was not, which was different from the actual environment that the product would be used in. And the way the lighting and all those aspects play, it just changes the perception of things. And I, I bring this up because it's pretty difficult once an executive has seen a certain thing in a certain light to to steer their mindset away from the meaning that they have taken out of it and to be mindful of the ambience that that the prototype needs to be in. And I think that kind of relates to the way you mentioned the entrance of the, uh, the hospital. Keeping in mind the ambience, that's one of the factors that comes into play. Changes the perception even before uh, it goes to something functional. It's just the image they build in their head based on the ambience and the, the visual display of what this. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And there's there's a lot of ego built up in that as well, isn't there? And saving face and saying, I I think it should work like this and therefore you're wrong sort of thing. And it's the best position we can be in as designers to is to be at arm's length and say, look, it's not my opinion, it's not your opinion. Look at them. You know, th those are our customers or our people or whatever. Look, I don't know. You can shrug your shoulders and inside you're saying, and it's a whole lot to do with design process. But yes, I think that that thing about seeing if things are not tested in the right environments that you were saying, Sashin, and, and then you can't necessarily have that arm's length to say, look, this is the real, as realistic a situation as we can, and it's either failing or succeeding, or whatever the outcome was, to be removed from that situation. But yes, environment, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely, environment. And also use a cohort, like often where projects don't have time or money to go out and reach the right user cohort, people will say, we tested it with Bob down the hall and he was fine with it, so let's go to release. You know, <laughs> you're like, not everybody's, uh, our clients are not all going to be software developers or, uh, <laughs> you know, experts in this thing. So we'll talk about environment yeah. and we'll talk about user cohort as well, but that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And the level of um, expertise as well as important. We'll get into that, but yeah, it's yeah. Um, cool. Welcome. And Darina. Yeah, for me, I think the valuable learning that I'm currently experiencing with prototyping, actually a physical design for my work where I, as I mentioned, I am working on a technology for reducing plastic, right? It's a really physical, a physical prototyping that we do, but then when we do like the minimum MVP uh, product and then we test it to the customers and we have a lot of learnings and we thought that the learnings, it could be embedded to the more developed product. And when we actually make the advanced product and then we thought that, okay, this, this is the ideal technology that could be helping the customers and probably fit the customers and then but when we test it again to the customers apparently not not all of the advanced aspect and features are actually the customers are actually needed so i think it's really important to always iterate your design and models to fit with the problem solving part and yeah i think that's the most valuable learning that i currently learn like the by um, the end of the day it's about the problem solving delivering most advanced thing or yeah that's i really surprised that that's really hard especially if you're if one round of testing said something and you you yeah. pin your hopes on that and then you go to the next round and it just completely falls apart that's happened that happens but there's not much you can do but it, i guess it it does really hammer home that the mindset we have to have is just to be so accepting of being wrong. And because mm -hmm. people around us generally don't have that mindset and, and that's, you, you, you have to be the one that rolls with the punches if you're the designer. But yeah, I really sympathize that. That's, that's such an unfortunate thing to happen. I'm hoping that you're able to push through that and get to the, get to the right answer eventually. We'll probably talk a little bit about iterations today, but I think and we can possibly talk a bit at the end about maybe like when you go from this kind of explorative, very small numbers, qual style stuff into scaling and quant and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I'm just reading your comment there, Kyle. Yes. I think I have a, a slide coming up on that kind of thing. Yeah. We'll get there. But mindset, I, I think Darina, yeah. Mindset and resilience as a designer in this process has got to be, <laughs> number one that I'm taking away from that but yes thank you for that story cool so let's talk about prototyping today we've got um, about an hour to go through um, the exercises here I want it to be as hands-on as possible so I haven't got too much in terms of slides um, I'd rather have more discussion with you guys it's really good but yeah what do we need to get started what should we prototype how do we start and what can we use are the sort of four anchor points and then at the end we'll We'll come back to anything else that you wanted to chat about. Cool. So let's let's get stuck in. So proto first and earliest, and I think this is 
very much, as I mentioned before, I'm doing a lot with government at the moment. And I think there's a real hesitancy to do anything early. There's a real desire to have all the answers, get the solution completely figured out and, and just run with some solution. You guys are the experts. What's the answer? You're often put on the spot for that. And I think, so the first kind of thing I would say about prototyping is an agitation to do things early and to do things first and to do things before things have been set settled, before people have entrenched opinions about how this, what the solution should be. And before you've even got a real, really strong opinion yourself will help as well, because you have to manage your own bias and things like that as well, which can be really hard. The first challenge I want to put on your table there is about prototyping before you even start this stuff. If you're prototyping really late in the game, you'll find it very hard. It's much easier earlier in terms of the design. What is harder if you're prototyping earlier is the stakeholder management. It's, it's what people around you think about this. Why are we going to customers with this half thought through idea? Why can't we present them with X, Y, Z? Or in the case of, I think Kyle, you were saying there was a design system in your current, yeah. And in that case, it's great because you can produce things really quickly at a high fidelity, but it hides the fact that it's not necessarily the best thought through idea. That's the, but you just have to manage it. But I'd say the first thing I want to put on the table is proto first, earliest. That's what the word root means. And it really applies to us as designers. We need to agitate to do things earlier than anyone else is comfortable with, even yourself. That's the first challenge. Ooh, all caps, Abram. I, okay. I, wanna, this is, I was reviewing a, a, a report that I wrote for, I went into Nigeria a couple of years back to do increasing detection of tuberculosis and it's on the background of COVID I think everybody will be able to really relate to this like tuberculosis has been around been a, been mostly eradicated from most countries for 20 or 30 years except it's really persisting in some countries it's very much like COVID in that it's highly infectious it's just it, it has a higher death rate than COVID but lower transmission rate and um, if you think about it like imagine tuberculosis but just to give you a kind of a an anchor point for what it is and the challenge here was people weren't getting tested enough in Nigeria and Nigeria there was six hotspots around the world and USAID and others picked Nigeria because the problem with people not getting tested and getting treated as with COVID is you get the incubation of new variants of the disease. And some of the new variants are extremely drug resistant. And so if you if you stamp it out with your basic drugs, if you stamp out the basic disease with the basic drugs, everybody's happy. If you don't stamp it out quick enough, you get these variants emerging that are resistant to drugs and it just, you've lost the game. It's real risky. And so there's six hotspots around the world for tuberculosis, of which Nigeria is one. And so I was lucky enough to work on this with a, an area called Breakthrough Action, which is a subsidiary of um, Johns Hopkins University. I had a look through that report and I'm going to scaffold this whole session on this, this work because I think it was quite interesting. It was lots of fun. But I love this paragraph here. We work under the belief that everything we do or make can be improved and we must put our ideas into action in order to learn how to improve them. Like that, if you're a designer, that just is Yes, if you're anyone not, that's not a designer, you're like, no. <laughs> so this is the first point of controversy. Everything can be improved. It's a mindset. And a lot of people are very scared by that. They want the answer to be perfect. They want it to be the best answer. They want it to be black and white. We don't seek to validate our ideas, but rather to identify how that could be made better. Like again, if you're in government, that is terrifying. We only want to validate our ideas in government. We want to be the, the smartest people in the room. If you're in uh, finance, even just big companies and things like that, the whole mindset is usually about come up with a solution and then validate with customers, come up with a solution, validate with stakeholders. So prototyping is anti these things. It's about not validating. It's about identifying how they can be made better. It's assuming that everything is wrong and that it can be made better in some way. You just run out of time. So. The prototyping process is about pruning away what's irrelevant and not holding any kind of holding to it. I'm not being worried that it's changing. Reinforcing what's successful. Hey, that worked. That's great. And, um, and changing track really regularly. 
when people, potential users interact with it. And you want rough but tangible versions. And that's the kind of tipping point that we'll go through a little bit today of how you get that. So this, I just love this paragraph. Uh, it just was in sitting in the middle of the report and I just was like, I have to pull this out because this is perfect. I'm not sure who wrote it on the team. I think it might've been Tim Fife, who was my wingman on this project. He's a fantastic designer based in um, the US, Pennsylvania somewhere. Cool. This project as an overview, I mentioned it's about tuberculosis. So the focus was on detection rather than treatment. For 20 years, the USA had poured a bunch of money into this and other aid agencies did. And it had a big effect, but then it just stuck and it just hasn't been able to eradicate it for years and years, like 20 years. And so there's a lot of pressure for something new, something different. And But we had funding, we had sponsorship, we had a very small window to do something before they wanted the answer. We had about three weeks, so it's not long. And prior to this three weeks, though, a big discovery project had been run. I just want to show a thumbs. Is pe are people familiar with the concept of a discovery? Yes. In a word, I would say this is your exploratory research where you're going out, you're talking to lots of people, you're trying to find the pain points, you're trying to find the major players the personas, this kind of stuff. So at the end of that discovery, we had a really big, rich resource of field research. Also all the prior research that had been done before this particular project. So I was coming in at the point where research, had a lot of research been done. We had personas, we knew exactly where we wanted to focus. We just didn't know what the solutions were. Did a short bit of ideation with a bunch of health leaders and experts and things like that, about 40 of them. We, we in country and we prioritized sort of something like 700 ideas down to 12 concepts down to five promising different areas that we wanted to focus on in the three weeks and then the idea of the the three weeks is to go out in the field and test those ideas as soon as possible so that's an overview of that project yeah next and the at the end of the three weeks we had to have solutions first thing to note when you're designing and really focused in on a product it's easy to forget or like whether it's a digital product or a, it's easy to forget the context within that which that operates so one great thing about doing that big research is you get a human center view of where your product sits and it's not like customer appears out of thin air customer buys my product customer is happy disappears into thin air after giving us money that's not what happens it's like Customers doing a bunch of stuff, interacts with a bunch of people, might see product, might be influenced by others using product, might come back to it, might make purchasing decisions. In this case, talking about um, public health, you've got someone who just thinks they've got a cough, goes to work, goes to church every week or a mosque, visits the local chemist, they call them PPMVs, and gets some cough medicine. All this time, this person has tuberculosis. And as we know from COVID, like you can see the contact tracing mounting up that they'll need to eventually do. They might go to a traditional healer if they're in um, Nigeria. This cough is not going away. What have you got for me? Uh, they might eventually go to hospital. They hopefully, someone hopefully identifies it. They hopefully get tested. Only 25% of people made it to this point in their journey. The other 75% will die. So it's... Uh, it's quite a, this is why this is such a problem. They get their results. They hopefully go through six months of treatment and a lot of them actually turn into um, advocates and, and to help others as well as being TB survivors. So there's lots of, you can look at this as a kind of a tragic pathway, but you can also look at it as, oh, there's lots to, there's lots to explore here. There's lots to prototype here. What's the solution to get that person on the left there from their home straight to get tested before they've gone through all that and everything. What are the, all the solutions? And the first thing I want to just impart on this is there's not one. There's a lot and they're, they're in different environments, workplace, church, traditional healer, PPMV, hospital. So there's lots of environments there. And within each environment, there's lots of complex systems of people around them as well. 
So if you think about this as like a customer journey or something like that, and you think about all the environments that your customer moves through before they before or where they could interact with your product or what you're trying to build or your idea, this kind of map that you can get out of, I just drew this up very quickly while over in, on this project, but user journeys is, I'm hoping that most of you have seen user journeys and things like that. That's where you start figuring out some of these things. So we could prototype at any point, and it's important to recognize that there's not one environment that your um, thing we usually operate in. And so there's, that means there's many prototyping opportunities for many projects. We'll just skip ahead a little bit, Abram. Yeah, we made a bunch of prototypes on that project. I won't go through them in detail because I want to get to yours. But let's go to the first sort of session. What do we need to get started? Ideally, ideally you're coming off the back of some research. I would say you can go straight to solution prototyping and do your research with an idea and see how people react to it. It's just really risky. But if you've done a bit of research before you start prototyping, you know who your personas are, your customers, the environments they operate in, a little bit about the opportunities within each of those environments, but mostly the outcomes you're looking for. And uh, let's see what else we got there. So you'll probably need some kind of toolkit. So that could be a design system or it could be a physical toolkit. We had um, plastic tubs full of scissors, sticky tape, cardboard, markers, just really lo-fi stuff. Helps if you have a, uh, a craft store nearby, <laughs> can be lots of fun. Apparently there's no blue tack in Nigeria. I had to take a like a big packet across. Is there blue tack? Just quick check. Is blue tack a thing in the US? No? Okay. <laughs> so Shin, is blue tack? Is, are you talking about masking tape? Painter's tape? No, it's putty, sticky putty. Darina, if you got is blue tack in Indonesia? NATO? I've heard that, but I've never used it. <laughs> okay. So it's like this kind of malleable sticky putty that you can stick posters on walls with, or you can, it's amazing stuff for prototyping. Yeah. Um, I think I, I think, it, I think I, I find it the most innovative. Yeah. So we ended up taking the same box of blue tack around like for several weeks because it was just so useful in this logistics. We had, a team of people were able to take us to and from places, our environments really quickly. That was really useful. And we had permission to do stuff. So we had people going ahead three days ahead, talking to councils, talking to police, talking to schools, talking to everything that we needed ahead of us. So we had this sort of staged permission envelope, if you like. The other bits are about ourselves. What do we, what do we need to be ready? We need to have no attachment to the solution. We need to be genuinely open to this being completely reversed and 180 on us and not worry too much. I mean, there's always a little bit of attachment, but the less, the better. And no shame, get out there, do it. Talk to a customer. It's, it can be petrifying for people, but as designers, we just got to take that on. And most of all, a hunger to learn, which I think you guys all would have. That's why you're in this business. So cool. That's my list. I just want to see your list. Like, how do you know you're ready to start prototyping? And I want you to think, let's go to the um, mural. And I want you to have a quick reflection of the stuff that you've heard from me, but also about your project individually. And Kaldeep, just so you know, we're just thinking about a project that we have are working on or that we have worked on that we think might be a good candidate for this session about something you might want to prototype or wish you had have prototyped. So thinking about your current project or the one you have in mind, how do you know you're ready? And what do you think, then the second question is over the right there, what do you think the barriers are to doing that? Or what are you worried about if you, and it, maybe we'll go back Abram to that previous slide just to show like my list and see what do you guys not have of that list? So just throw a couple of posted downs first and we'll, then we'll have a chat in about, um, Cold deep. I just uh, shared the link on uh, the chat. So you should be able to access that. Let me know if you can't. Also just yell out if you're having any troubles with Miro. 
I've been using Mural a lot lately, and it but <laughs> the transition from Mural to Miro is is mind boggling. It's really frustrating. Anyway, Miro's so great. <laughs> you got that too, Carl. I love Mural. M Miro is good, but Mural is where I live every day. Yeah, it's like switching between PC and Mac constantly, yeah. which is what I do at work. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, pop something in the. Thanks, Carl. Deep. Awesome. Okay, you're on. We're just in that middle section there. Yeah, there's some really good things coming up. Keep going, guys, and think about the that question off to the right there as well. That what are the barriers? Cool. So I'll just start to summarize here. Some great, great post-its, great um, ideas here. I'll start there with like Sashin. You you put there good comprehension of problem statement. I think that's really important. Like. I've worked, unfortunately, and we probably all have worked whole projects where people haven't really agreed on the problem. It's like, I have this great product I want to sell. <laughs> what are the weak areas? And we often don't like to discuss weak areas of things or things that could be problems or barriers to uptake. And, and I think that is the perfect area to start prototyping. I think yeah. it's actually... Yeah, session go. And another thing is, the level of depth of understanding that can vary across different stakeholders. And it's, <laughs> it is understanding the depth of un uh, understanding required by the various stakeholders and yourself and uh, making sure they're on the same page. And that can be a little contagious, contentious sometimes when you believe it needs to be A, B, C, D, E, but the other one thinks it needs to be A to M or it needs to be A in uppercase, lowercase, all the different uh, alphabet styles you can think of. And that takes, that varies depending on the stakeholders and on the, the uh, kind of problem that's been addressed as well. But I think once it's defined and agreed, after a lot of friction, I think it's a solid ground to stand on and move forward. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's worth going through that friction before you start your prototyping because otherwise you'll be undermined by someone coming out of left field and saying, this isn't a problem. Why are we even playing with this? Or my customers said they liked it. What are you doing? Yeah, agreeing on the issues and seeing them as opportunities to strengthen it and, and actually stating it in that way to say, this is, you know, this is a part that we reckon this is an opportunity to improve it, be future positive. It's easier to be future positive than to start a fight to say, this part of the product is terrible or this is never going to work. But saying this part, we don't understand enough about how this audience is going to use it or we don't understand how our product works when it's in this kind of environment. And yeah, definitely finding out how do you grow that sense of curiosity in others to improve as opposed to having battles about how bad <laughs> this thing is or what we don't know? So how do you go, oh, this is amazing. How can we make it even better? It's a great place to start. Having an understanding of what's viable culturally, I'm not sure who wrote that, but that's a great one. It's saying, yeah, we're probably pretty certain about the thing but we don't know how it interacts with the complex system around it. I think that's a really nice time to start prototyping as well. And what else we got? So after we understand our users and personas, like I said, it's always great to have a bit of research to base this on. And that doesn't have to be a six monthy kind of massive thing. It could be just a week of chatting to people to figure out, chatting to people outside your organization to just figure out what's going on. That can give you enough to start really just you'll definitely learn enough to get streets ahead of where you would have otherwise been moving on to these barriers over here concern that people will view it as a finished product yes <laughs> feel that i think the only way to belay that is to outline a program and to say that this is about we're going to spend two weeks we're going to spend the full two weeks or we're going to spend two months or how long you have and we will start here and it's going to be even better at the end and we're going to go through and and i think the the approach we took with the usaid project was to say we've got five ideas we don't mind if we kill off four of them because we'll, we'll know that fifth idea is 
uh, like the killer idea and it's run the test of time. That's the one that's going to solve this. You know what, we might end up with four amazing ideas. But the idea that you can have multiple kind of approaches on this is quite helpful as well because it means you don't have to get attached. So you might don't create options for options sake. I, I, I hate that. It doubles our work and it's usually not great. If But only if you've got like, in the case of the TB project, we said there are so many different environments we need to solve this for. Why don't we create prototypes along that journey? Or there's so many barriers between this person and getting tested at this hospital. We can do one on transport. We can do one on this. We can do one on that. We can do it there. And they're fundamentally different. And so that's a good time to do that. But in, in this prototyping process, it sounds like taking a lot more work, but actually be open to the idea that if you have many things to start with, you can more easily cull one or two out during your process and be left with the strongest ideas. And, and I think that appeals also to investors or to, to executive that you're doing a process of survival of the fittest in this kind of prototyping rather than sticking to, sticking to one idea. Cool. Time. Yeah, look, but I would say this project had about two that I'm talking about with an Nigeria one only had two weeks to do the field work in it, and it did we had 40 people in five teams but but still it, it, I, I think it's more just design it around the time you have if you have a week then design one iteration for a day if you have six months then design the ways that you can do releases throughout that or, or whatever your your endpoints are cool that's great let's move on so what should we prototype this is hard. It's, if you're working in a digital space, you might think I'm going to t prototype the screen flow or the or this process or something like that. And if you're working in a product space, you prototype the product. I want to encourage you to use this technique. And if you look at the picture here, this is, I got everyone in this these teams to do storyboarding. And this helped to open their eyes a little bit to the the system, the human system around their product or around their idea. So they came to this exercise with a specific idea and it might be, we're going to, I can't quite read the one on here, counseling. This is, people were having trouble with data entry in the hospitals. Tell me your address. Oh, I live behind the post office. I live behind the tree next to the post office, next to the busy road over they don't have an address and so we have this problem we had this problem in this project where we had an address field but a person saying i live next to the tree behind the post office and and so the hospital literally could not enter this patient who has just tested positive to tuberculosis and they need to do contact tracing and they need to do all these things and the system is set up based on you have a postcode and a fixed address just as an aside tb tends to over affect people in poorer areas because of the close proximity and things like that. A lot of whom don't have fixed or easy addresses. So this idea that you can see on this thing here is that what we'll do is we'll have a person that walks back or goes back to them, goes back to their house or place with them and uses a little thing. It's a little GPS app that just uses GPS coordinates for their address instead of a uh, postal address. Cool idea. That was what they focused on. There was a bunch of other things brought around that were great. But when they storyboarded it out, they realized all this stuff about the context of this person and how they would get there and what needs to happen beforehand and what needs to happen after. Storyboarding out the sort of before and after of, of your product or thing can really help to open up to Yes, we could prototype the product, or actually we could prototype the sales process that precedes the product, or we could prototype the, the the stages beforehand or the way to get people into the right environment where they'll interact with our solution, or we could prototype the after part and what happens when they're using it to, to then refer on to a friend or to all these kind of things. So we're going to do a quick exercise now on storyboarding. Um, we're just going to do the nine post-it storyboard. So you can see what I did in the with this team was to give them a big sheet and have them draw little pictures across like an, a sheet divided into eight. And I said to them, put the interaction or the idea that you have in the middle 
And let's go to Miro and we'll start this um, ourselves. Let me just bring up Miro there. So you can see the create a nine post-it story part of um, the board here. Just claim one of those nine groups. Start in the middle post-it. Write the thing, the idea or the key interaction that a customer or user has with your product, like a scene, what would a what would the scene look like? It'd be like, yeah, I won't speak for you, but let's just start in that middle and say, what does the interaction look like? The main interaction with that product that you're thinking about look like? And then you can move, post-its are great because you can move them around, but you can see that there's four post-its before that and four post-its after it and sort of think about the steps and stages before and after. And you're building up a kind of a little storyboard of interactions this person has. And it's from the person's point of view. How did they get, what were the four steps before they got there? What were the four steps after they've done whatever they're doing with your product? Let's take a couple minutes for that, but you don't have to fill up all nine. You can, you can have three if you want, just to just do a light touch, but just encouraging you to think about the, the context of the before and after a key interaction point. Okay, does it, everybody, does that make sense? Any questions before we, Brian? Yeah, yeah Brian, you go first and then Sashin, yep. yeah. I, I, this is around the idea of the tuberculosis. Uh, on your own. own completely thing. own. Yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I have my own idea though. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've given you enough of the background on the TB thing, but yes. You yeah, could do TB if you want, different. but um, okay. have a think about a project that you've done in the past or, or something you've worked on. And yeah. So, Shin, was it you that had the question as well? Yep. Yeah. So, essentially, the way we storyboard is have the central theme of what we're doing in the center. And does it have to be a sequential storyboard of a. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So, the circle around it is the sequence of actions that we desire to flow within the system of the people or in the people world. specifically of the people and how do they come to it and how what do they do after they've interacted with it so your usual design will be on that middle post it'll be i'm designing all the screen flows or all the parts of this product and that's my middle interaction that's my if i'm making a if i'm pointing a camera at someone using my product, that's what that middle post-it looks like. But what did that person do before? How did they come to know about this? How mm -hmm. did they get there that day? What's, yeah, I, what all led I to that? Give an example, if that's okay. So yep. I'm thinking about, this is something, we just moved into a new house. So we had to sign up for internet so I can work from home. And so for example, I put in the middle here, I put signed up for internet and then now I'm, going like the first step that I did was like go to Google and see what what providers service my local area and then I say went to some comparison sites to see what the different plans were based on like my criteria and then I was like no nah, I hate comparison sites because they show you some and not the others and so on and so forth does that make sense as a sort of storyboarding my sort of like my experience almost of signing up for internet Yep, and then what happened after as well, Abram? So like you've signed up for internet. I know with my internet, there was often a terrible service with the installers and before I even had the internet on, <laughs> turned on, I had to go through a lot of other hoops as well. So this is a pretty classic user journey, Or, but I think on the storyboard format, that it can be quite nice because it's quite accessible to, to think about it like a comic strip or a, and draw little pictures and things like that. And you can show that the interactions. I'm getting you to do post-it stay for time reasons. If you do this as a sketch and you get people to draw people and the interactions between those people, you get some really rich insights just from the sake of making people draw this out. Like how should this work? Even if it's an ideal world, how should that flow work? And then often people go, oh, that's not going to work because they didn't know about it here. And they, this person doesn't exist. And, you know, <laughs> so yeah, this exercise is all about just how do you think the world works around this product cool i'll give you another minute on that and we'll and we'll move on doesn't matter if it's finished this is really just to get you thinking about the around piece and Darina, i'm thinking like yours would be great like where what situations do people use these 
alternative plastics and and um, plastic products and things like that. I think that's, I'd be really keen to hear yours if you're <laughs> willing to share. Okay, when you're feeling pretty comfortable with that, or even if you're half done, below that there's a little cluster of four post-its. And I'm just trying to see, oh, we'll get to them in a minute. Yeah, there's a little bit more to talk about first. You can keep working on that. I'll, I'll just throw some thoughts at you while you're doing those nine post-its there. But Abram, let's go to the next slide. So this is one of the ideas was about something like 97% of people in Nigeria attend a church or a mosque regularly, every week. And the idea that the folks in this team had was, let's see if we can get religious leaders to do some of the because they're very well trusted to do some of the education parts about testing um, for tuberculosis. And so they mapped this out and a whole bunch of other ideas came up. Why don't we even just make once a month, bring testing centers to religious settings or why don't we actually have TB survivors from that area or even that parish, if you like, sharing their stories and this kind of thing. So they were they were mapping this out on this storyboard here. And what you can see on those post-its are the kind of ideas that I'm going to get you to think about now, which is what would you prototype on each of these frames? If you look at these frames, the top one is something about the advocacy engagement. And they ended up focusing on this, like before they even get to there, it's like a lot of health programs have tried to enroll religious areas in in this kind of health um, advocacy and, and education. And they're extremely arrogant about how they go about it. And what the folks on this team were saying, what if we actually learned some teachings in the, what if we actually applied some teachings from the Bible or the Quran and, and actually like approach at a much more religious level rather than just saying you should do this because you're a leader in your community, which is where a lot of them had failed. So like they were trying to prototype, what's the, what's that, chat look like how do you respectfully engage where so many programs haven't which i thought was really interesting so they've mapped out this storyboard and ended up choosing that top post-it note about the first contact with the religious leader in an area rather than actually the the you, you can imagine they could have prototyped the materials or the information that that they want religious leader to give but they talked about how do we engage respectfully Cool. So moving on to the next session now, we've got our set of, hopefully roughly finishing up on those nine post-its. How do we start and where do we start? So that story I just told there about that team decided to start at a different point because they thought if we don't have any religious leaders enrolled in this program, there's no point in developing materials for them. Like nobody's going to want to use them. How do we start? And if you maybe go to the next um, slide there, Abram, we've got this is what ended up happening for the five ideas. Now, if you think of each idea as being a seed or your product as being a seed and that it grows through the prototyping process and the methods they used differed as well. And some teams started with an app design, but then when in, this was the team that was doing the um, GPS based address tracking. But then they went off to think, actually, now that we're in a hospital, there's a whole bunch of crazy processes around the form entry of the address anyway. Let's do a bit of ethnography while we're here in the hospital and figure out what is actually going on here now that we're focusing in on this address entry thing. And then they ended up thinking about what about the role description of the person who's taking the person home to, to get their address. And so they were really flexible. All the teams to their credit, were really flexible in where they chased their ideas. And you've got to think about this prototyping as being not about validating your original idea, but about letting it go off into all sorts of directions before you hone in on the most strongest branch there or the strongest idea at the end. And this is also good to know when you're prepping your stakeholders for what to expect. So just wanted to show that to say, this process, if you allow, will take you through all sorts of different methodologies, all sorts of different um, product types, 
and you're looking for the strongest branch, right? So let's apply that to your work. There's four post-its underneath those clusters of nine, clusters of nine. So if you go back to the mirror now, I've got one blank one there. And then I've got three special ones. If you start with a blank one, what would you prototype of your nine above there, of your storyboard? What's something that you would want to learn or prototype in that story and that uh, you think would make a good prototype? So have a minute to pick that out of your nine and say, so I'm looking at Kaldeep, you've got one that says search for the nearby e-scooter. You could do something like, or should we prototype a part about searching for this or should we prototype signage out on the streets or you know what you know so just thinking there's all different things you could do there but like that could be one a great topic is that whole searching for a nearby e-scooter okay so there's one Darina adjusting customer solutions based on their context so this could be something like you're trying to find, you're trying to hone in on a particularly difficult customer or a particularly valuable customer or something. And you're trying to just learn more about their context. And so what's a, what's a minimum prototype you could throw into that context to learn from how they interact with it? So you would say, it's probably your next post-it, which is prototype several solutions and tests, but like it's about understanding that particular customer types environment, something like that, that could be one. So that's making sense, folks, just going into some depth here and I'm, any questions would be welcome at this point. So you're just picking one thing you might prototype and learn from your nine, so the storyboard you've made, and you're placing it in the top left of the four. I think everybody's nearly got one. Great. Then try and answer the other three. Learn. What do you want to learn from this prototype? What's the thing you absolutely don't know? What's the problem you're trying to solve? The next poster is where? Um, what's the physical environment you need to either go to or simulate for this to be as real as possible? And the last one being, who is it? Who do you need to test with so that you can hand on heart say, this is as, this is as good as it gets? Is it fighter pilots or is it older people with a, yeah, uh, chronic disease or is it? Yeah, so hopefully you get some of this information out of your research that you've already done, but you can just estimate this. But I think these three things are supposed to be good trigger questions for you that if you're trying to do any prototype, be it digital or otherwise, what are you trying to learn? Where should you test it to make it realistic as possible? And who should you test it with? I'll move on to the next one here while you're doing that. And I think a driving question on this next slide, Abram, is how do we make as little as possible and learn as much as we can? This is like a real economy here. Like a lot of the time, you, if, if you think about how that contrasts with most approaches, it's how do we make the most finished, shiny product possible so that people don't give us any feedback. <laughs> That's most processes, right? So we don't want to change it. But this process is about how do we make as little as possible and learn as much as we can. So this is, and here's some things that can help that. It's actually really good to have time pressure. Why is that? Why do you think time pressure is good, anyone? It makes you think in creative ways more often than not. Yep, definitely. I'm thinking maybe it gets you to choose your focus rather than trying to test everything. Nail down what's really important to test it. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So time pressure is almost the antidote to getting attached to something. <laughs> it's like you don't have enough time to really love something. So you're taking out something that you've just knocked up and you're not really worried about it. And that's when you're going to be most open to it being changed is when you're not attached to it and also your team as well like the people around you and your stakeholders you're like we only had a data this is a lovely way to get out of why this isn't perfect but but i think time pressure is really important i think as long as you're not hurting people with it as long as you're agreeing that a time pressure is x and y it's not people working over weekends and things like that 
the time pressure, it can be really positive force in this process. And the idea that you do lots of small iterations is way better than trying to get something right if the, in inverted commas, if that makes sense. Optimism of potential, you have to be optimistic if you're a designer. You just, <laughs> you get knocked down too many times if you're not. So you guys got to share your optimism with people around you. This is going to make it better. Flaws in this thing are just going to make it stronger. This is what we want. The next one is about your toolkit, your ability to change it quickly. Expect to change it. Don't go into the field expecting that you're not going to learn anything. You always will. And so what are you likely to need to change? These guys here were testing this kind of ticketing system in the picture here. And this kind of, it, they used to have a form that a referral form, which was like two pages long and no chemist would really want to fill it out for someone to get a, a TB test. And they just made it into this little ticketing system. But the chemist was like, I've got a lot on my table. What can you put on there? And can we give you a calculator as well? <laughs> you know, it's just a random idea because the guy had a calculator and he stuck it next to the ticketing system. And it's like, oh, that's a bit more useful now. <laughs> you know, it's just improvising. So ability to change it quickly comes down to your toolkit as well. What have you got to hand and how resourceful are you to just try new things? And um, go for many iterations, not perfection. I found that on this particular project, and it may work for others, other projects I've done didn't have this, but I thought just while we're talking about this project, project a daily rhythm. So we prepared everything in the previous afternoon and evening, planned out where we would go and who we would test with, so that when we woke up and we woke up early, we would just bundle into a car with a ready prototype and going to a destination that's already been sorted out. We do the morning testing, come back and have lunch, a bit of a sort of a snoozy lunch. And then we'd spend the afternoon critiquing, iterating, planning, updating, and then going out the next morning again. I found that rhythm, it was tiring. You wouldn't want to do lots like this, but it was really good because it meant that every time you wake up, you know exactly what you're doing that day. You don't have any kind of, there was one team who didn't use this rhythm out of the five teams that did this and they got stuck and they were still prototyping in the morning, trying to get everything right. It's 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, everybody else is starting to come back. They hadn't gone out in the streets and they fell a lot behind the other teams. So a daily rhythm can help. And yeah, look, if you've got someone looking after your logistics and your permissions and all that kind of stuff and you, someone's done your ethics approvals, you know, then that is only going to help. <laughs> so having a separate person to deal with logistics lets you design the thing. Look like nice if you can get it. Okay, moving on to the last part of today. We've got about 12 minutes left. So last part, what can we use? And I want you to think about your theoretical toolkit now. So before you came into the session compared to now, I just want you to have a bit of a reflection on your the storyboard you made on that mirror and the kind of the thing that you have outlined that you might theoretically be able to prototype and think about if you're prototyping in a complex system of people or how a product interacts with people how would you expand your prototyping toolkit what didn't you expect to have in your prototyping toolkit that you would now think is perhaps quite useful that's just an open question I think for me, it's less uh, <clears throat> like it's not a specific tool, but I think like the ability to shift between one sort of approach and the other to go from space design to product to forms to apps to, do you know what I mean? And having that skill set, because I think that's, <clears throat> I think it's really easy to talk about it, but it's difficult because you have to have some way of thinking about these things or like knowing how you put them together, which I think it kind of reminds me of CrossFit a bit, which is you have to apply lots of different skills in the same type of workout, which is, yeah, I guess like something really interesting because I think people, or I've often, often thought of prototyping as we're prototyping like an app. So therefore we have to stick with an app and we just prototype the app all the way through as opposed to saying, okay, what if we change the environment? Would that make a difference to the app or how people engage with it? So that was awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that's great. And uh, yeah, that's great, Abram. And also just thinking about like changing cohorts is, uh, is an interesting one too. It's hard to do on a dime, but it's like very important. Like what if we actually have the wrong person here? That's a really hard question to ask in the middle of a project, but a really valuable one if you can do it. Yeah. 
any other thoughts on what's in your toolkit? And, and as Abram has said, it doesn't have to be a physical toolkit. I'm talking more of a, a capabilities and skills and things as well. For me, I think what I learned from seeing all of your projects, I think it's really important to really understand the context, like the, with different contexts, different tools, different, maybe different people, also different frameworks, but it's really to, yeah, to, as I think uh, Sahin also mentioned, to see the environment to, for the prototype to be perceived as with the objective that we want, it's really important. So yeah, I think that's my takeaway from what I'm going to concern in using for the next prototype. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Very happy to hear you say that. <laughs> Any other comments, folks? I, I really like the whole walk uh, that you gave us was connecting discovery, prototyping, and even in different contexts, be it service, complex human systems or products and help wrap my head around the process so much more better. And I'm actually waiting for the video recording to expand my notes. And yeah, it was it was eye opening and uh, an enriching an experience to understand things a lot more comprehensively. And thank you, Abraham, for uh, pushing me to get on. Really appreciate it. This was wonderful. Thanks, Probably Sophie. one of my best sessions. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for coming. We're going to do some takeaways in a second as well. Some things I want to leave you with, but yeah, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you. Let's go to just the takeaways here and then we'll do a quick um, open conversation. So I suppose, and, and that was a good segue second to say, I, my personal journey has been from digital products and realizing that there's a whole aspect of design about getting people to those products and an aspect of design of once they've used those products after then that we need to design. And if we don't, we can ignore it, but then we won't know why people hate what we have made or <laughs> love what we have made or whatever. But if you consider that this product exists within complex systems, they're humans and humans are really unpredictable, but fascinating and really interesting and lots of fun. And ideas need to grow within a complex system. If you can think about your product as always existing within some kind of complex system and it's up to you whether you choose to take it or not to design around what happens around the outside of it. And that's where prototyping can help. The way of the quickest way to break that down is to maybe do a storyboard like we did today. I like drawing pictures of people and things like that, make it real like you're doing a comic strip or a movie. Visualize the context and sequence of use. Like what do we even think happens out there? And you'll immediately pick up some flaws or some also some um, misunderstandings between the project team to say, I don't think that's how it works. But this person does this. And then you have some great conversations about the context of your product. Like Abram said, I think before, it was just don't try and do everything. Start with one thing. And that's where, again, that storyboard technique really works well. There's other techniques, but I think the one that we did today is just to say, here's the thing I'm going to focus on. This is the stage I want to improve. I'm going to tackle that one thing with that one audience, and I'm going to expand from there. When I said before that we did five at once, it was five separate teams doing that, but in parallel with a single focus each. So be focused on the one thing you're doing with. If you're lucky enough to work in a big team, you can have different designers working on things in parallel. But for you personally, try to just have a lot of focus in this process. You're never going to find a silver bullet. So iterate. It's part of the process. That means just put as many cycles as you can in. And, uh, and you know that every cycle will improve it and you will learn something. We didn't touch on measurement today, but there's a lot of desire in teams often to measure the effectiveness of things. 
it's a bit dangerous in this process because you are trying to change it all the time. So you need to set up some space with your stakeholders to say, we may be able to do some measurement here, but I do want to make this project uh, product. I don't want to change this product on a constant basis so that we get the strongest product before we measure it. So you just, I won't go into depth there, but I think that's enough to say, just be careful of measurement in this process because you will um, end up changing your baseline if that makes sense. And then your measurements are useless a lot of the time. Get out there. <laughs> don't get attached to things, just try something. And that's agitate to get out and test something as quickly as possible. It's one takeaway there. And you prototype not to validate. I've come back to that quote at the start there from the report. You prototype to find the weakest parts and strengthen them. So you're trying to look at your own ideas or as can be complex, other people's ideas and say, I think this product is weak in this way, or I think this is a pain point we're likely to have. And you focus on that to prototype, to strengthen it. And the whole idea is that you're all working together to try and strengthen this product. You're not trying to validate the bit that already works. It's a waste of your time. Prototype to find the weakest parts and improve them. And as you all will be, be curious for change. And don't worry if you're right or wrong you love what you're doing. It's a, it's, it's a nice thing to, to iterate and improve and say, we started over there and look at the value I've added in two weeks, two months, whatever. But be curious for that change. Cool, that's my takeaways. I wanna just, got probably two minutes left. So let's just quickly go back to the, the mirror. And I just wanna have a look at the things you wrote at the start, how to make prototyping real, Actually, does anyone want to call out something that they don't? We maybe haven't covered today that they want to have a quick chat about before we end. There's someone about conflict there. There's one about prototypes for a wicked problem. Yeah, I'll mention the, the, the conflicts one here. So um, I've been, been really driving participatory design, and it works great when you're in your sense making space, or your discovery space, and then your ideation space. But then inevitably you get to that, okay, let's build a prototype. So let's dot vote, which marginalizes everybody that loses that dot vote. And you're no longer in the participatory design space. You've, you've eliminated the factor of your group and you've gone with the your majority rule component. I've been trying to get into a, a portfolio of, of prototypes where it, instead of dot voting on what are we gonna do, we're trying to get into quadrants of, this is a coherent idea, it's viable as a prototype, and there's something to be tested there. And if we can prove those things, and if it's eight different things, then let's find a way to test, hopefully not eight different things, but more like four in one of those sessions. How do we deploy four prototypes? And even thinking about null prototypes so that I, we think this is going to be the thing, but let's put the, the total opposite of that there as well, just to make sure that we're thinking about it correctly. And so I really like the, the storyboard approach and the, the real quick, the, what the learn is the, the environment and the cohort attaching to that, because I think that's an easy way to define what that prototype will be. And Hopefully, if we can keep it lo-fi in my world, then we can deploy those things pretty quickly. But it, what I was having a hard time with was, okay, how do I, how do I go out there and say, we're going to build four prototypes now? And I think this is a great way of really summarizing that or, or getting our hands on that. I, I love the picture you just painted of your room full of people who are all enthused and then you dot vote and then seven out of eight of them are like arms crossed in a corner going i didn't win <laughs> you know like that's yeah, i really is, sympathize um the terrible side effect of democracy <laughs> isn't it isn't it look i think that's it. it's just options to and we talk about voting with our feet sometimes a dot vote might not generate like it'll generate the thing that you're talking about is that sort of alienation of people whose things didn't win if you like and you have winners and losers so it could be that you if you say we're gonna, we, we think we can do three areas here. Here's here's seven. Let's draw up this storyboard, and here's seven sort of things we could do, and then vote with your feet, and you end up with a pair here, and a single person here, and a pair over there, and a single person there. If you got enough faith in them, 
you could remove yourself as the immediate designer and be more of a facilitator and help that pair and that individual to have their first prototyping experience. And like it's all this needs time, of course, but it's it could be a way to bring them back on board to the project and give them like, I'll, I'll coach you through a one day prototyping experience of this. And we're going to try and learn as much as we can in a day. We're going to do the thing that you're really passionate about. I'll, I'll teach you this process. Then we'll come back together and figure out the, ri- the, the one prototype that we do invest in. But like letting people vote with their feet and move to a team that on, on a thing that they can. And then maybe you, you sort of facilitate them being a designer for a bit and just experiencing something out of that before you can then bring them on might might work but yeah i, I don't have any don't have any great solutions for that it have happened that happened to me a lot and so i really sympathize kyle yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's it cool is. but I, I think getting giving people a taste of design sometimes works it's oh cool i'm in the driver's seat now i wanted to do this and kyle's helping me to with this new skill that can turn people's mindsets around that's just exactly. a random thought cool we're at time, folks, and that was really fun. But any last thoughts? Thanks so much, Charlie. This was awesome. Like Sashin said, I, I would definitely echo his thoughts in terms of this being one of the best sessions we've had. So thanks so much for making the time. I know you're supposed to be at work and stuff and all that good stuff today. But yeah, and thanks to everyone for coming. I think it was amazing listen to people's different experiences and almost like case studies of like projects that they're working on. So thanks, Charlie. No problem at all. It was a pleasure and nice to meet you all. Thanks very much. Awesome. Have a good one.